and the session is being recorded. Okay, welcome everybody to today's CPD webinar session with the lovely Teresa McKinnon. Um, I'm looking forward to this, this should be great. I'm Debbie Baff and I'm the Membership and Professional Development Manager for ALT. Uh, just a quick uh, reminder of the access panel there for you. I know I've just gone through this, but um, if you click on the bottom right hand corner, you can access the access panel and the chat function. So there will be some uh, chat today and Teresa also has some various links for us to, um, to click on and uh, have a look at as well. And um, you can also um, raise your hand to ask a question. I'm sure you guys know that because uh, we, we've all been doing this for a long time now, but it was just in case anybody needed a reminder because all the buttons tend to shuffle themselves. Okie dokie. Um, right, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna stop sharing this and pass over to Teresa, who's going to um, introduce herself and start sharing her screen. Thanks very much, Debbie. Thank you. And it's great to have have you here. It's a small but uh, perfectly formed group. And as I say, I'm I'm looking forward to learning from you all. But I'm going to start off just by sharing my screen with um, just a little bit of a session really to uh, try and make sense of the last 20 years of my um, professional life. But also what I've tried to do, having revisited how I've gone about the last uh, 20 years and the things that I've done sort of post internet, um, is to uh, examine something that I thought would actually end up as a timeline. In other words, just a sort of, you know, a collection of I did this at this phase and I did this here. Um, and I took a sort of autoethnographic approach to reviewing my journey in teaching and learning and I thought well wouldn't it be interesting or helpful to analyze that and see whether there were certain phases that I went through um, and uh, and whether there's actually some commonality um, between what I've experienced as I've moved from if you like analog teaching to digital teaching uh, and for in terms of the experiences that you're having either as a practitioner or in supporting the learning technology of practitioners um, and to see whether there are things therefore that we can share and learn uh, from that. Um, so I'm going to start off just by sharing my screen and showing you the first my starting point if you like so let's just uh, grab that. Right, so what I've done is use a Jamboard here. So you should now be seeing my starting point. So I've, what I did is I looked back over the various things that I've done over the last 20 years as a practitioner in language education, um, in higher education, um, was to identify certain key moments. And many of those I've reflected and placed on a Padlet board that I'll share with you in a moment. But my starting point here uh, is, is really to give you an idea of just how far away I was then from where I am now. And that was a bit of a surprise to me, really, I have to admit. So this was my point de départ, this was my starting point. Um, I had uh, been given a role within my school now, it wasn't a, it was a language center at the time we've been restructured so many things have changed um, but my role uh, within business language education and teaching was to try and support uh, the digital practice of our uh, learning uh, our language teachers our language tutors so my starting point really was was quite scary for me and I've been very much reminded of it. Debbie and I have just been through the last sort of uh, 20 minutes or so from hell when I discovered that my laptop wouldn't connect to the Wi-Fi and, you know, we hadn't got long to go before the session started. So um, we that was a really timely reminder for me of just how much I've been through from that point, because 20 years ago, the internet was not a terribly stable place. 20 years ago, when I was talking about moving from analog to digital and using web 
resources particularly, there were still all sorts of problems with URLs, still all sorts of um, issues that meant that you could prepare and plan a lesson but not be able to deliver it when you actually came around for whatever reason. The, the website was down, the, um, you know, the, it, the internet wasn't available, whatever it was, or it didn't work the same from your planning as when you went into a classroom. Those sort of things really push the blood pressure up of any practitioner. And I'm sure you've all had um, experiences along those lines. So one of the first things I wanted to do was to to investigate because I'd come from a secondary language teaching background, um, investigate what the Internet was all about in a sort of scholarly way. I wanted to find out more um, so that I didn't feel quite so lost online. So scholarship became a sort of principle um, at the big at my in my starting point, wanting to find out more um, about the impact of Internet on teaching and how we could use it in a way that wasn't just about uh, the shiny shiny but was about high quality learning experiences and there were huge challenges fortunately at the time at Warwick there was a, a postgraduate certificate running um, called the Weller certificate I had done a PGCE for training before I started teaching analog teaching in the days when you know I had one computer in my classroom uh, that wasn't connected to the internet, of course. Um, but now I wanted to investigate what it would be like and what e-learning could do to support my um, learners and my practitioners. Um, um, the beauty of actually being part of this e-learning pilot project was that it started from a point that assumed that you hadn't actually been on an online course, and I hadn't. So back in 2004, I joined uh, Jay Dempster's e-learning pilot project and started to experience learning online. It was a very basic VLE, um, but we were all encouraged to blog our journey. And it was very much uh, a, um, an experience that helped me understand what it would be like to use uh, the internet and to use online tools as a learner. Um, and, and I don't think I really realized at the time just how crucial that was as a starting point, because it really made me focus on how does it feel to be in this environment. I had fabulous tutors on this. I had great tutors when I did my PGC at Warwick as well. But on the Weller um, PG cert, we had great support. And it was a very emotional experience, partly because I was you know, trying to work full time and study full time, but also because of this, it, the importance of uh, the tutors understanding the emotional context of what I was doing. Um, and I, I reckon that was particularly important to me because um, during that period of my life, my father died. Uh, during that period of time, there was there was a lot of change around me. So a lot of things happened that made life uh, quite difficult, uh, but it was a really useful starting point for me. So that was where I started out. Um, and what I then started to do, and I will just flick on into the second phase here, and then we'll just recap over these two phases, was try and um, find other professional opportunities. The, as a result of doing the Weller uh, PG cert, I went on to do a, a master's in um, postgraduate uh, teaching and learning. Um, and blogging stayed part of my experience. So I still went to, back to Blogger and I used Next Steps. Um, I set up Next Steps as my blog. And I found when I actually dug back into these very early posts that I was hardly writing anything at all. I was just using it to capture stuff that had caught my eye, stuff I wanted to investigate. Um, and, and that was particularly about finding networks, finding other people who could help. And I think on that slide, as you can see, I've got my first ever response to a blog post. So this was back in 2010. And Mark Childs, who actually had worked at Warwick, I think he was working at Warwick at that time, responded to a post that I put up. 
And, and then I started to feel a connection. And you can see there from the Tags Explorer image at the bottom. I know um, Sarah and possibly others of you are very familiar to it with the Tags Explorer. You can see how that network started to connect and draw me in. And I started to find other people. Social media was an important part of that. Um, but that was how I started to understand what connected practice could do for me. Um, and that was pretty crucial. So let me just stop the sharing a second and come back into the room. So uh, just do a quick check of the chat. Right. So what I want to do is to because in this session, I'm going to ask you to interact with me. I'm going to ask you to uh, follow that experiential path. And I'm sure many of you have have already um, been engaged in interacting online. But let's just uh, show you a few places that I'm going to provide. Uh, and if you can just keep these open as additional tabs in your browser. The first one of these will look a bit daunting because it's just a blank page and who likes blank pages? So it's a blank page that I've set up as totally open for you to um, add any thoughts that you have um, as they occur to you. So while whilst we're um, together here, it could be a picture of where you are now. It could be a thought, uh, a reminder, perhaps, of uh, something that's been mentioned that you that resonates with you. It could be that you've started from somewhere totally different and you might want to share that with us. So essentially what we're doing here is just providing and just providing an, an open space for you to share. Um, now, here's another link I'm going to ask you to um, keep open as a tab. I apologize for this. You're going to have lots of tabs open. Um, but we all come to this room and this space from different places. I've told you a little bit about how I got here, um, but I want to hear about how you got here. And what I want to do is to try and understand better the commonalities or the challenges and the barriers. Um, what I've set up here is just a spreadsheet. Um, and on it, so it's a Google spreadsheet. And again, it should be open for everybody to edit. Yeah. And as you can see, I have listed some of the tools, not all of them, because it would have been too daunting, but some of the tools that I found useful over the past 20 years um, in order to build my online presence. I've, I've given, I've just put a, you know, one word purpose, but feel free to use your own words to express them. And I've given a link or an example. So anyone can add to this. Uh, there are filters on here, so if you want to filter it, you can do. Um, and I know, for example, if I look at uh, the, the things that Deb does to express her online presence, I know there are tools that she uses that I don't use, and I'd love to know what they are and uh, you know collect, curate them on this list. Um, because I think although other people you meet on the journey or this is my conclusion so far reflecting back on my own journey they give you ideas um scoop it for example was something that uh came from my uh, uh, early days following of uh, steve wheeler uh yes voice thread that's a wonderful one there are lots of uh tools out there that i saw used and thought oh that might be useful i'll try that out I've left a column as well for comments. Now, I haven't filled comments in, but I think, you know, it's really useful to have your thoughts and comments on tools. Um, and all of this is anonymous, so you don't need to feel anxious about what you say. Put, put in what you think and let's put these together. Discord is something I've only just met recently. Great to see that starting to get populated. Thank you. I'm really grateful to you for participating because this is what it's all about. Really, today we are connected educators and it's really important that we share that connectivity. Right. I'm going to do probably my most uh, brave thing because this isn't something that I'm terribly um, au fait with. So let me just share my screen again. 
and collect some thoughts. Anything I ask you to do today will be anonymous, so please feel free to say what you really feel. As I've recently retired, it's a wonderful freedom to have. So around the first two phases, which were uh, finding my starting point, which was all about really the impact of the internet on my practice, and then finding your thing, finding your uh, place, if you like, um, within that, finding things that would work for you professionally. So here's the first question I'm going to put out to you, and I'd really appreciate it if you can pop into Mentimeter and use that code in order to just note down for us. Since the first day, and I can remember it quite clearly because my husband bought us a router, and I was terrified about put, connecting the computer to the internet. And I think it was probably that fear that made me play close attention to what I was doing. Um, so how has the arrival of the internet and the affordances of the internet changed? I was gonna put your practice, but actually I'm interested in any practice you's, you've observed, maybe if you're working as a learning technologist alongside um, academics, what have you seen? And of course, we've had this horrible pandemic, which has really focused minds on uh, the use of the Internet. What have you observed? How has the Internet changed people's practice? Um, so any any thoughts, positive or negative, that you want to record there, pop those in. And we will update let me just uh, in fact there's a link i need to share with you in the chat as well isn't there so that might give you quicker access let me just grab that and pop it in the chat for you um sentences words exactly how you prefer not worried at all you know bullet points are fine um, and if you're doing things on that uh, Google Doc as well, feel free, you know, if you want to write a poem, if you've, something occurs to you, yay, Debbie started us off. Lovely. Where did your journey start from? I'm going to have a read through these because that's really, really helpful. Great. Okay, a move from FE to HE. So you've also done that shift um, that, that I went through from secondary into HE. It is a strange feeling. It's like you're going back to the beginning. I've experienced the same. Yes. Right. Wonderful. You've got your dream job. How marvellous. My experience has been that dream jobs also contain nightmares, but <laughs> that's, that's part of life. But how useful to have that. Thank you. Good to have that. Uh, those thoughts. Wonderful. I'm starting to see things come through on that shared doc. And now we're starting to see things as well on um, on the uh, let me just share my screen again on the Menti poll. So let's share that and then we can have a discussion around that. And please feel free to use the chat. I'm sorry, you're going to lose the tabs and uh, such is life. Right share that and see where we are now for the internet changing practice yes certainly that was my my first um feeling was the internet is going to help with the with international collaboration and obviously working in a, in languages it was hugely helpful and really important to get involved in that diversity what a fabulous word we have to be really careful don't we that we don't end up just collaborating with the people we've always collaborated with um, and yes, you might see that sentiment reflected in the things that I talk about in the second section. Finding things. Yeah, we so where will we be without, you know, Google it. Global collaboration. And that's really where the work on um, virtual exchange comes from. Open learning. And I really want to explore that with you um, because I think we, uh, you know, we have different takes on these things, don't we? So it's good to. Ah, and serendipity, that wonderful word. Yes, the people you kind of bump into that you didn't really know were there. Oh, I love that. Yes, created curiosity. 
wonderful I, I i found personally now this experience was was is very that resonates with me um i very much found that by engaging with the internet once i'd got my head around it uh, and there were lots and lots of journeys there that was that was a, that was a big journey in its own um that there was a tendency very quickly from colleagues to to define me as a digital champion or a digital evangelist and that brought headaches as well as advantages it meant that people engaged with me on conversations when they were looking uh, to get online uh, and looked for looked to me with for ideas which was really wonderful oh yes and yes indeed real relationships um, but it also meant that for some people who who didn't really want to engage with the internet and with any new tools it was very easy for them just to dismiss me as a digital evangelist um, so it brought positives and negatives way out of the box yeah who needs boxes fabulous right i'm going to stop my sharing and come back in i'll leave that open obviously so that you can continue and let me just check back in the chat i'm really starting to see things coming together yeah so thank you we're starting to build a whole set of resources here and thoughts and feelings as i said they are anonymous to you so they're not uh, you know you don't have to be anxious about what you put in there um, but it was really important for me to find um, sort of a support network and actually you know the things that you've already shared with me touch on this fact that in fact um, we have to when we get into these professional opportunities they may not be local to us and they certainly weren't local to me um, so I had to go out looking and sometimes that meant uh, that I really had to uh, make sure uh, that I, that I understood who I was connecting with and what their um, expertise was in the area and you know it, that that is just a journey um, so from that point I started then to think about how I was presenting myself um, and to make sure that the connections I made largely through social media use and this was thanks to people I, I bumped into on Twitter out there so people like Sarah and people like um, Sue as well and I, I think you, you would recognize my PLN I, I share that with you as well um, lots and lots of uh, well actually at the time there weren't that many but there are now um, I started to bump into people uh, online Steve Wheeler was one of the first um, who helped me build my confidence in that domain um, let me just share with you the second mentee question which I hope has come out to you but if it hasn't just let me know and I will make sure that I've pressed whatever button I need to press in mentee so let me just check back in the chat and see if everybody's been able to access that let me know if you can't see it so what i wanted to do then was to create some sort of image that would communicate what my professional focus was to other people and exactly that's where i started my blog the next steps blog which really was was actually my focus wasn't was never to be writing for anybody else it was very much to be keeping a note of what i was doing for myself um and uh pulling together as well this idea of um who i was and what professionally i was about a bit moji yes a bit moji in a gif yes we need some examples i know who put that in or i think i know who put that in um so please please do tell us you know how did you or how do you or how are you thinking of um, presenting yourself in the open in order to attract the right sort of um, audience and the, the connections of people oh I love that 
big fan of screencasting. I like to, like to show the companionship of the voice. When when I was uh, when I did my PGC, when I trained to teach, um, the importance of voice became very obvious. You know, I mean, they talk about teacher stares. Well, I can do a teacher stare. That's, you know, the teacher look that just says, whoa. Um, I think any of us who are practitioners have that. But you also have to cultivate your voice. Uh, and, it, uh, you know, your voice online is slightly more complex uh, to communicate. And certainly when I started out, voice over the Internet was uh, a bit of a dark art. So, you know, we weren't in the days, I wonder if anybody's added it so far to the tool collection. We weren't in the days of Flipgrid. Um, oh, we can see, yes, we're, oh, excellent. Somebody's put Lumen 5 in, thank you for that. That's brilliant. I wanted to put that in too and I forgot. So yeah, we were starting really to see um, people's, people thinking about um, how they could it was before the YouTube generation, really. It was that had, that was only just starting to take hold. Um, but sharing video and voice because of the issues of the size and the delivery uh, were really problematic. And that was particularly problematic for me from a language perspective. Um, do jump in and grab a mic if you want to, because what I'm a bit concerned about is whether everybody's managed to get that second question on the mentee. Um, yes, yeah, that's, I think voice is, is important, and but it's it's not just a case of um, voice in terms of looking at all the, the way you communicate as a whole, actually physically your voice, you know, how do you sound when you record things, how do you pitch uh, to your audience, do you envisage in your head a certain person that you're talking to and, and uh, what they are and how they are and what they would respond to. Um, so it's voice in a, in a whole collection of ways. Um, great. I can see we're really starting to pull lots and lots of ideas together. And that's that's really what we're here to do um, today. Might not be what you thought you'd do, <laughs> but it's what we're here to do. So those were my first two phases, if you like. It was about, first of all, you know, understanding my starting point, understanding what I wanted to get from the next phase, if you like, of using the internet for my teaching. And secondly, finding my uh, focus. And my focus really was voice over the internet at first. It was simply that. How do I um, get people listening and speaking to each other, obviously with a, a language learning aim in mind, um, and in terms of principles from that phase, as I looked back, and obviously that that phase within my um, development was very much including um, presenting at conferences and getting out and talking to my communities. And there I started with the communities that I felt would understand me best. So language teaching communities like the um, Association for University Language Centres, uh, where I talked to them about now, I'm not a Germanist, so excuse my pronunciation here, but I talked to them about my Bildungsreise, a reflection on my journey and the journey that I wanted to go through to support the use of voice tools in uh, language education. Um, and it was a battle I fought long and hard and um, really was very challenging. So it's kind of at this point that I want to think about um, the importance of collegiality so this was a phase where I wanted to share the vision that I had, because if you're going to find your voice, you have to know what you want to talk about and how, what you want to communicate. Um, in my case, as you've probably seen, if you follow me on Twitter, um, it was to use the Ammonite as a visual presentation. And I wonder whether any of you um, have also visually presented yourself. Looking back at that sharing space document that we've got, Deb's given us a really clear idea of of what she did and there's a blog up there as well so the, these are parts of your voice aren't they these are the visual identities that you use to help people realize what you're about uh, and decide whether they're going to uh, engage with you um, and that that's a really important sort of phase but it's also quite a demanding phase um, and 
I found the collegiality very important at, in that particular phase. And it has been throughout. This is why I didn't go for the timeline approach on this, um, because collegiality is always important. But it started just like my Ammonite. It started uh, with a very small, central uh, group of people who were supporting me through um, the Weller project, for example, and through my um, Warwick e-learning award and things like this. Um, so it started with people who were local to me and then gradually as I became more open as I was using more open tools that expanded so just like the Ammonite the circle got bigger and involved more people and moved further away from the center uh, and that was really what I was trying to um, convey when I used the Ammonite um, uh, avatar um, it took me to all sorts of different places because once I decided that actually it was quite useful to get involved and to be more open, um, then I needed to do lots more exploring. I spent a lot of time in a lot of different spaces. So Second Life, um, Rhizo, uh, a lot of the uh, connectivist MOOCs that were going on. I know, Sarah, that will resonate with you. Um, doing things that just basically involved hashtags with communities that I didn't know and people I didn't know um, uh, that took me out of my little bubble and into new bubbles and helped me uh, connect and understand uh, what I wanted to do and which of those elements would be helpful in my professional development. So I'm going to pause just there. Let me just come back into the room. Ah, I'm talking about Rizo. Rizo, Rizo was. May, um, Deb, is it possible for people to have their mics in case they want to uh, share with us? I, I think or they should have it already. Um, Great. Okay. But if not, give me a shout and I'll make it happen. <laughs> well, I think uh, Sarah, if you don't mind, would you would you mind? Or I, I mean, often people find themselves in offices where it's not easy to uh, switch a mic on. But if you are willing to, um, just switch your mic on and tell us a little bit about your experiences of these connected education environments that became available really quite quickly in the last twenty years or so, and took on a sort of life of their own. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think, oh, yeah, I think for me it was um, Dave Cormier's Rhizo 14, which is the one I think that I met you, Teresa, and I met so many other wonderful people who are my friends now, including Simon Enser, who I was talking to at the weekend. And it just, I think it just opened the world up. Suddenly with these connectivist MOOCs, you get this idea of freedom, don't you? And the idea that you can play, but it's serious play. It's playing with educators who are passionate about learning. And I don't think there was one moment or one thing, but I think just this sort of connected learning experience changed my life. Certainly changed my PhD um, because I started doing my PhD on all of these experiences. And you're going to have to excuse me because my cat has just jumped up onto my table and is sitting on top of my microphone. <laughs> They have a way, don't they? They just have a way. They just know. <laughs> <laughs> Participatory cats. <laughs> yes. Well, that's what the internet's all about, isn't it? There's just, there has to be cats involved at some point. Thank you for that. And that's that's really good. That's really good um, uh, participation. And uh, uh, Claire, I wanted to mention as well. Yeah, it, it is hard, isn't it, to think, um, you know, how do I go about... Um, promoting or pushing myself forward especially when you don't quite know what's going to what's going to come out of it um, having opportunities to connect really helpful i think i think if i could offer any one thing it would it would be just give yourself space and time to do a little bit at a time and decide um, i can remember points during these sort of 20 years when i have been online way too much uh, and when really I should have got away from the screen and taken some exercise or done something different. So actually the, the ability to physically go to conferences where you spend time, you know, sitting on a train, you spend time is sitting in a plane or whatever it is, that gives you that space, that headspace to think things through and to read. And 
I, I, I do worry a little bit that under the you know current situation it's harder for people to do that um, so building in some opportunities uh, where you can um, look back and think and in fact I, I think blogging helps that because you capture stuff that then makes you try to make sense of um, of what's happening right okay excellent is there anybody else who'd like to chime in at this point or we will oh i can see simon's in the room as well simon did mention he'd be coming along so yes i'm, I'm moving now simon onto the phase that involves a little bit more um about virtual exchange and the journey that we've been on together since then but before simon and i met and we met actually on a blog over a, a blog post steve wheeler's blog again his ears must be burning this morning um i had spent quite a lot of time thinking about how online digital practice was going to affect my teaching including a, a, a realization that was quite a, a crucial realization to me that um i had always been as a practitioner very much um, pro experiential learning and uh, interaction and discovering that in fact when I was moving these sorts of experiences into a VLE I was getting more behaviorist and that was quite a shock and I really had to sort of pull myself up at that point and think how, how do I change so that my teaching style actually isn't uh, adversely affected uh, by what I do online and, and that took time for me that was a journey so simon if you're there do feel free to chime in but uh, what we're going to what i'm going to show you next is the third phase of my journey so let me just share my screen again and jump us in virtually to the jamboard that is the point at which really or the phase at which really i realized that in fact um this had become more of uh, uh, more than just what i had to do for my job because when i started out it was very much uh, driven by my job and very much driven by the um, work that i needed to do in order to support um, other practitioners and, it, and it, although that remains there, although I've retired, but I, there was more to it uh, than that. Uh, it made me really focus on which aspects of my pedagogy I particularly wanted to uh, develop. Um, assessment very quickly became part of that and uh, understanding of assessment. I, having, having by then spent over 20 years in teaching, I thought I knew everything I needed to know about assessment. Yeah, I, I you know, invigilated hundreds and marked thousands of exam papers. Um, but as I really got back into basics because of this focus on digital learning, I realized I needed to understand what the principles were of assessment. And, um, and this was a huge challenge. So fortunately for me, there was a, a PG cert available within my institution on assessment, and I found that really helpful. Um, although it was it was nothing to do with digital practice in assessment, it was purely to do with the principles of assessment and the differences between assessment for learning and assessment of learning. Um, it led me into um, you know a really deep dive around the literature of assessment. Um, it also led me into, uh, or at least this aspect, the internationalization aspect, led me into thinking more deeply about how the use of online tools affected the nature of interaction and communication. So I got involved in uh, the uh, Eurocall uh, Special Interest Group, Computer Mediated Communication Special Interest Group, and I chaired that for a few years. And that gave me a wonderful opportunity to hear from people who uh, were researching in very detailed ways uh, the use of online tools um, for uh, communication and their effects. So that was really helpful. Um, but by far the most life-changing aspect of, uh, of this phase really was a decision to challenge the institutional basis 
of what I did. So ever since I started teaching, I've created resources which I've shared with other practitioners. That was just part of the way I always worked. So if I made worksheets and things like that, there'd be a little file that I'd put out and say, you know, if you can use this, feel free to modify it, change it, go ahead and do it. I'd always done that. Um, but what I realized with the internet when that came along was the biggest challenge and opportunity that came around was that I could now share my now digital um, PowerPoints, for example, with a wider group of people um, and make them available online. And at first I was really, really nervous about doing that. But I opened a SlideShare account and after the first few months of just putting up, you know, my usual PowerPoints that I was using in class, I realized that they were getting hundreds and hundreds of downloads. And I thought, wow, there really are people out there who who want resources, who are interested in resources. None of these resources were created with any thought of them being the best resource on X. They were very much um, created as a practical response to, you know, teaching this particular class this year and what I needed to cover. Uh, and there are still, when I look back on my SlideShare account to some of my first uploads, there are some I look at in horror and think, I really must adjust that. I've made a mistake there and I should change that. <laughs> so then in no way put up there as shining examples of perfection, but they were just a way of, if you like, producing um, an online accessible folder for people. But then around that, I also started to realize that there were issues of, around my understanding or lack of understanding of um, intellectual property. Um, and that again led to another sort of scholarly um, investigation, if you like. So I started to look at um, how we manage our intellectual property online. I started to discover that language teachers in the UK were selling resources online. And I felt that was very sad. I felt it was a shame that A, that teachers needed the money <laughs> to, um, in order to share or as a motivator for sharing. Um, but B, that actually in many cases they were sharing things that in fact weren't their intellectual property and they weren't theirs to sell. So I started to look at um, open licensing and uh, again, with some fabulous uh, connections that really were acquired serendipitously. Um, the wonderful Sarah Passfield Niafitu, who I met, um, who actually was based at the time in Monash, a Japanese teacher of Japanese. We investigated together um, copyright and sustainability, and we investigated producage. Uh, and if you're not aware of producage, I've, I've written a paper on it, so there's plenty there for you to look at. I'm sticking away from my um, scholarly outputs at the moment. Um, but it was very much about how do you go about being more open whilst protecting um, the things that you have created and making sure that they're connected to your professional identity. So the answer for me on that was definitely using CC Creative Commons licensing. Um, most things I share Creative Commons um, BY so that uh, attribution has to be given so that if somebody adapts or downloads one of my PowerPoints and then adapts it for their context, that's fine. But they just need to say in there, this was, you know, this is where I originally found it. And they put a link to my online profile. Um, and my engagement in those discussions got me more and more involved in the Open Education Special Interest Group. This was actually the moment when I first came across Deb Baff, another life changing moment, life enhancing moment. Um, I was in Cardiff for Alt's Open Education. I think it was OER 15. Um, and I was persuaded to get involved in the Open Education Special Interest Group. Um, that really did change my life. That made me realize how important it was that we as educators um, get involved in the political impacts of what happens uh, in terms of who gets access to learning. Um, and, and possibly some people might say, yes, but your Twitter you know, is, is full of the political. 
I think it was at this point that I started to really realize Frere's understanding of how education is inherently political. There was no way I could avoid uh, or maintain that sort of uh, tricky connection between the uh, between education and who has access to it and I didn't want to skirt around it. So it was at this point when I, I really got involved with um, uh, people who felt the same as me, who shared, shared the values that I share around education for all and the importance of learning for all and, and ALT has an open education special interest group which you will find very easily on the ALT website uh, and you can see our mission statement there is all about inclusivity and making sure that learning is accessible to all. Um, and from there really I got involved in open education practice. So finally <laughs> my, my fourth theme and this very much comes into uh, the category of stuff that would not, uh, stuff that if, if it hadn't happened, would not have been possible to um, learn as much as I have learned. And I, and I very much continue learning. And that was finding a space for reflection. And again, if I thought about this along a timeline, there was a type of re reflection going on right at the beginning, but it was very shallow and, and not terribly open. Um, and, and as my confidence has grown, I've started to share more and engage more. Um, and I found this reflection. I actually set up a, a new blog, a separate blog, which again, really, I set up with myself in mind, not writing for a particular audience. And those of you who've seen perhaps this Espace it's very much about reflecting on political issues as well as um, education. Um, but it gave me a little space that I could go to where I could cross link things that I could see happening in society with my thoughts and feelings about learning and education. And they particularly arose and sort of bubbled out of the connected practice that I pursued through virtual exchange. Um, so if you don't know anything about virtual exchange, I, I will give you a link at the end that gives you opportunities to uh, take deeper dive. But virtual exchange essentially is a way of connecting through technology um, individuals with each other, uh, sometimes just to share information, a very basic sort of sharing information but at, at deeper levels to actually um, co-create together the sort of things that happened, as Sarah mentioned, in RISO as well. And that happened still in lots of other places that you'll, you'll see hashtags for. Please, within that uh, document that you have, the sharing space, if you're part of one of those open communities that does this, there we are, we've got Rhizomatic Learning, wonderful. This document now is turning into a fabulous way, oh, <laughs> I love that, I get the cat as well, a fabulous way of sharing what we know in order to help uh, help us help, help grow. I shall return to this document and I will look at things. There are decisions I have definitely made throughout, uh, throughout my journey over the last 20 odd years um, that I would not have been able to make effectively had it not been for having time and space for reflection. And I, I think that if you want educators who are thoughtful and effective, you need to give them time uh, for, to find headspace. Um, and, and what happens then is they start to realise, and certainly I did, and I'd love to see the experience of others on this, that there are connections and where and that we as practitioners are at our most powerful when we collect connect our professional lives and our passions together when we bring them together the things that we really value with the things that we have to do to earn a living then we can be really really powerful uh, then we have an authenticity then we have a message um, so my steps along the way included things like um, building a community of practice and starting to recognize the individuals who had contributed to that. Um, starting to look at um, open recognition. Let me just uh, share with you a page here from my open badge passport. 
I very much went down this line because I started to realize that the journey I had gone on, I needed to be able to curate um, and remind myself, uh, not just through blog posts, but through little visual identifiers. So these sorts of networks started to become available to me thanks to the collection of open badges. Uh, so using open badge passport to curate those helps me to communicate uh, what I do and what I'm about. Uh, so that is just one of the networks and I'm going to just pop this link into the chat because I'm aware that there may well be those of you and I'll come back to the chat to see if I've missed anything who um, are interested in if you like the academic aspects of what I've talked about um, and uh, that very much is uh, has been my route to publication. I started out very, very shakily um, and followed my passions and my academic interest to get to a point where I wanted to capture these. And Sarah mentioned a, a similarity there of, in terms of pursuing a PhD. And that was never a, a journey that I decided that I wanted to go on because it was very much, um, you know, I was coming to a point in my career where I was about to retire anyway. And um, and actually, I felt, you know, I, I just love doing what I'm doing. So I've continued along those lines. And thank you, Claire. That's very kind of you. I, I really hope that you can take from this that actually, even though it's scary, uh, there are aspects of um, a bit of openness that really help us um, and that can be very uh, useful in terms of uh, sustaining us. The, the bottom line for me really uh, for all of this has been the importance of people. I remember back in my PGCE days uh, being taught about social learning theory and thinking, yeah, but I'm not a very sociable person. I don't, I don't think I'm a social learner. Have I discovered just how social I am as a learner over the last 20 years? It's actually been the Internet that has allowed me to discover that, because just as Sarah says, I have met real friends, people I can rely on, people who have helped me on my journey, people who've inspired me. Um, uh, I'm not saying there are uh, there aren't also downsides to that. Um, because there are, but I've fortunately not really experienced anything too horrendous. You know, there are always people out there um, who will uh, try to provoke, but I try and keep away from the provocations and ignore it. But that's just my strategy. I'd love to hear from, from you. We have just five minutes left. I'm going to just review the various things that I've shared with people. Just like in real life, exactly, Debbie. And I think that the expression that stays with me is an expression that came from uh, Steve Wheeler again in the early days. He said, "There's uh, everything I've learned about Twitter, I learned from kindergarten. It's so true. You know, the play nicely. Um, it's so important. Um, you know, life is challenging enough and we all go through huge challenges. But actually having... Uh, a passion and finding a network of people who can help uh, support that, but also finding that network of people who are willing to just share a joke now and again and, and you know, um, support you in that way helps as well to have, you know, a real life outside of an online life, because there are times when it really definitely is important uh, to switch off and to get away and do something different, something physical. Um, but you you will find people you can trust and networks you can trust. And for me, Alt has been one of those for me, but also a, a more informal network that's come through um, groups like BYOD, uh, DS10, always get the number wrong, DS10 something. Uh, that's a for Sarah will know. Um, all these fabulous uh, hashtags that you'll find on Twitter where you'll really find educators and yeah be be really selective um, when it comes to engaging with uh, certain aspects of social media because some can be um, negative 
Right, I'm just going to pop into the chat. TS106, thank you, Simon. <laughs> I always get the number wrong. <laughs> there was a race then between the two of you to get it in there. LTHE chat, yes. How could we not mention LTHE chat? Um, if you're not aware for, of it, Google it. Someone was saying earlier, yeah, the most useful thing about the internet is how quick it is to connect you. I was going to create a reading list for today, but I haven't. And the reason I haven't is because what I would suggest you read um, depends on what your interests are. And so I'm focusing just on sharing my ORCID ID, because then if there are things there in the things that I've written, um, you will be able to grab the uh, the biblio from the end of those. Simon, lovely. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. Mm. Wow. This has been a lovely opportunity. Uh, please do grab the mic and open it if you want to say something now. I'm, I'm, I'm done in terms of sharing my journey, but I'm going to pop a Padlet link into the chat. And on there, you'll find the things that I couldn't put in the Jamboard. So examples of the many networks and um, activities that I have found useful. Um, so they are websites and a collection of resources. Um, what I would do is encourage you to keep on being who you are, because clearly, um, you know, there's a lot of people who can benefit from you being who you are um, by doing it bravely and oh thank you Simon that's very sweet but by by being brave enough to be to do that openly and uh, please do connect and continue to connect and share thank you so much for for uh, coming along and uh, using your lunch time today to connect it's wonderful to uh, to have you all on board thank you so much <laughs> yeah, if we can find a way. I think there's a CPD badge, isn't there? There's an old CPD badge that can come out uh, for participants. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking an interest. It's uh, great to have you here, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks so much. Um, yes, there will be an uh, open digital badge um, for taking Ooh. part in this. Um, and I'm uh, I'm hoping to get those out um, pretty soon. But yeah, that's been, I mean, obviously, Teresa and I have known each other for a few years now, you know, but um, it's always a pleasure. And that was really, really just, you're just always such a giver. You really are. <laughs> it's brilliant. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed that. And thank you, everybody, for your um, contributions and um, participation in that. There's some great resources and um, links and things that have been shared. So um, we will uh, send around the recording of this so you'll be able to play it back. And um, and obviously we've got the links, excuse me, that Teresa shared as well. So um, yeah, just to say thank you ever so much. That was really, really good. I'm just going to stop you. the recording. <laughs> Thanks very much, Debs. And, and I have to say, the, the giving is not just, uh, it, you know, it it isn't uh, totally um, intrinsically motivated, if you know what I mean. It's, it's very much, you know, the giving means reciprocity happens. It does. You know, does. you give a little, you get a lot true. back. It is. So, yeah. yeah. Not, when, you, when you share, <laughs> people share back with you, don't they? You know, it's yes, really, and that's exactly. just coming back to what they were saying about being in kindergarten, isn't it? When you share your toys, other people share them back with you. It's really, really true. Really great. I'm just going to stop the recording and then uh, we're just about 